Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Vantage Point. It's Justin Nielsen here, and it is October 19th, 2022. And on the show today, as always, we've got our good friend, Arusha Pires, O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager, joining us. How are you doing, Arusha? I'm doing well, Justin. Even after that SC loss? Because that was that was a little tough. It, it, was, it was a tough loss, but uh, and, and, we're, and we're really unlike... Now- Ahead oh, yeah. of USC in the rankings, yeah, Ooh, I'm, you know, uh, un- unlike you know, unlike the way we look look at the stock market, uh, we're we're taking the long term approach for the long USC. view. Okay, yes. I, I get it. You know that that's I you know what that so ha- happens a lot of times in the stock market too. You know when things go too bad, you start having to just look at the long view. I I, I get it. You know so that's okay. Um, well, also joining us on the show today, this is really exciting for us. Uh, we got Dr. Thomas Carr on the show, also known as Dr. Dr. Stocks. Uh, he is the founder of Befriend the Trend Trading. So welcome to the show, Dr. Thomas Carr. How are you? Thank you, Justin. I'm very fine. Thank you. And I appreciate the invite you and Arisha bringing me on your podcast today. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it is our pleasure to have you. Um, we, we had a really great chat, uh, you know, before before the show and uh, kind of in prepping for the, the show. Really interested to kind of get your take on the current market and uh, also, you know, what you know, your your whole thing is about befriending the trend and uh, what you make of the current trends that we're seeing and how you have faith in those trends. Um, and of course, we'll get uh, some of Dr. Tom uh, Carr's stock picks for the current market. But uh, first, before we get into that, um, doctor, what, 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 where did the doctor come from? Tell us a little <laughs> bit about that. Are you doctor of finance, doctor of stocks? Uh, what, where, where's the doctor from? Well, that's a great question. And no, my degree has nothing to do with finance. I actually have three graduate degrees, two masters and a doctorate, and they're all okay. in theology and philosophy. So I studied at, uh, at Princeton, then went over to Oxford for six years and uh, earned degrees in both philosophy and theology. Okay. And we were discussing the other day, you and I, that um, this really actually gives someone like myself a very good background in uh, the reading of economic data and uh, stock charts, because a lot of the work that I did as a graduate student was really about studying um, the interpretation of Mm -hmm. of ancient texts primarily. But when you're looking at a stock chart, it's really the same discipline. You have to hold back your presuppositions. You have to detach yourself from any expected outcome, and you have to let the data or let the chart speak for itself. So it really was uh, in, in kind of a roundabout way, uh, a, a very good training. Mm-hmm. I, have, I have no training in finance or economics. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of happy to say that, actually, because I think <laughs> my story can help inspire folks who feel like they can't get into the stock market because they don't have that kind of background. And it's just simply not true. Well, and now, sometimes it's a benefit because there's all of these kind of common common wisdom and, um, you know, the, the academia of economics and finance sometimes kind of leads you down a path of not necessarily how the market actually works. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat. I'm an anthropology major and right. Uh, right. My, my economics class really kind of consists of high school economics. Um, so everything I've learned has been a little bit more from the market. Um, mm-hmm. What about what about you, Arusha? Just since we're sharing, uh, w- what what degree in finance did you get? Uh, no, I, well, I, I was a bio major. I eventually ended up doing a, a master's in finance, but okay. Uh, but yeah, uh, but Dr. Carr, the you know, w- w- I, I I found it very interesting uh, with your background, and honestly, I thought the par- there were a lot of parallels that, that would translate pretty well, especially stock charts, because. There's a when you look at a stock chart, when you look at trends, you almost have to have a belief, right? Mm-hmm. And and kind right. of go with the flow, right? There there is a Zen uh, kind of way that we look at charts and and trust the trends. You know, did you see those kind of parallels? And and do you think that's how it, it appealed to you? Maybe why stock charts and the 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 way that you invest. Uh, you know how, how why you ended up going that way instead of more towards kind of the traditional finance route well no that, that's a great question um i think that what attracted me to stock trading to be very honest was the thought of making more money <laughs> <laughs> and i think that's probably why we all get Simple into it you know, that right i was yeah. a i was a very underpaid 
overly educated professor and I did that for 17 years and I wanted my wife to be able to stay home and homeschool the kids. Mm -hmm. So I needed a, an extra income in order to really support the family properly. And I knew that investing, trading, uh, that sort of thing could really provide that. And over time it did, it didn't initially. I mean, I, I have a story in um, my, my uh, book, Trend Trading for a Living, where I described the very first stock that I bought. And of course it was a complete flop. And it was a couple of years before I even started to break even. But I think there are two things that my background in theology and really my background in religious wisdom in general uh, is very helpful to anybody who's trading, myself included. And that is that, number one, every religious tradition always has uh, emphasizes the virtue of humility. Mm -hmm. And it is very, very important that whenever you approach a trade or a chart or a long-term view, you need to have some humility about your projections. We're very often wrong. And as a day trader, I'm wrong several times a day. And if I don't admit that, I, I'll get in real big trouble. So we have to be very honest about our mistakes, very honest that we didn't have the right read, very honest we didn't have the right management in place. And that certainly helps. The other one is detachment. Every religious tradition teaches detachment and we need to be detached from our own projections that we usually put upon the chart. You know, we, we can have that bullish feeling about the market, about a chart, about a stock, a company. And we start looking into the chart and reading things that aren't actually there. We have to let the chart speak to us. So we have to be detached from those preconceptions. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And and just real quick, uh, because I, I did find it very interesting, you, you touched on it a little bit, but what was your dissertation on? Because uh, I just found it fascinating. Yeah. So I, I, I was writing on a couple of German philosophers and their, their, uh, their discipline was the uh, theory or the philosophy of interpretation. Mm -hmm. And it might seem like kind of a simple thing. You know, how do we actually derive meaning from a text, which is something other than myself? It's speaking to me from an ancient source in many cases. And I have to somehow get what the writer intended to mean into my head. So I understand not only what he meant, but how it applies to my own wisdom, my own thinking, my own life. And that's quite a process. So uh, philosophers have a lot to say about that process. And to, to a large degree, really, the, the key to interpretation is to hold back, as I said, your preconceptions and allow the, the text or the stock chart to, to speak for itself. Mm -hmm. what, what about, because uh, sometimes when two different people are looking at a stock chart, they mm -hmm. may actually end up seeing different things maybe from actionable you get kind of action points or maybe because they're looking at different time frames or time frame. their entries are different right? right talk a little bit about that i mean even in just in your trading room or or the people that you're mentoring do mm -hmm. you run across that i i do all the time okay. i i post 20 or 30 stock charts a day over on mm -hmm. stock twits and twitter and the facebook posts and linkedin and so on and i always have a for the most part, I have a read on the on that chart and I'll draw the trend lines and I'll usually draw some arrows where I think it should be going, might be going, ought to be going based on what I'm seeing in the chart. And invariably, there will be half a dozen folks who respond in the annotations that I don't see it that way. Yeah. And for the most part, it's a distinction that needs to be made between my read of the chart and their read of the company. There are a lot of Tesla yeah. bears out there, for example, right. but the chart itself is often in a bullish pose. So those perma bears on Tesla are always going to argue with me about my reading on the chart if I think it's bullish. And but they're coming at it from a totally different angle. And that, that's fine. We just have to be clear where we're coming from and the framework that we're working within. A lot of times, too, as you said, suggested, Irusha, that uh, it's, it's a difference of the time frame. Mm -hmm. I might be looking at an hourly chart. They're looking at a weekly chart. We have very different readings. Yeah. Or it could be, you know, the time frame of your your horizon, 
you know, if you're right. looking at something and you're like, oh, I'm just looking for a quick swing trade, um, you know, you're you're seeing a setup that looks pretty good as opposed yeah. to, oh, I'm looking for something that is, you know, more long term. Well, then you might need a little bit more evidence before you 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 got got involved in something because yeah, you're no, exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. The time frame, the length of the trade that you expect to, to hold on, that how high your profit target is, how tight your stop is, all of those things will go a long way toward determining whether you're overall bullish or bearish. Mm -hmm. And so why why trends? What what got you started with the whole idea of trend following? Because, you know, again, a lot of the stuff that you've written, you know, uh, that you founded, the the trend, you know, that seems to be one of the, the main key components of, of what mm -hmm. you're doing. So so why trend following? What got you into that? Well, that's a great question. Um, and I think the simple answer is that the the very first trading course I took was on uh, trading the trend. Mm -hmm. And it was the very first trading discipline that I learned. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, I'm sad to say that the fellow who taught that course ended up going to prison for some fraud allegations. So uh, <laughs> I can't so recommend he didn't course. teach you that part. <laughs> no, he didn't. No, he didn't. <laughs> but I, I did learn a couple of really important keys. And one is that um, there are some very easy standard ways of determining the overall trend of the stock. You've got your longer term moving averages, which give you the long term trend, your mid term moving averages, mid term, short term gives you the short term trend. And when you see these moving averages flipping on top of each other all the time, you know that you're in a transitional phase. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I always have these five categories of trend, strong trend, weak trend, trading range, uh, sorry, strong uptrend, weak uptrend, strong downtrend, weak up downtrend in the trading range. And you can determine which of those five market conditions you're in simply by looking at the 20, the 50 and the 200 period moving averages. Now, I've gotten a little bit beyond that. I use some other tools. I'll show you one here in just a minute. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, knowing the trend is really the one of the two keys to determining market direction. Mm -hmm. Got to know the trend. And then secondly, you've got to know whether you're near at or just about to encounter a top or a bottom. Right. You know, I know it's not always possible to call the top or the bottom, but we do need to know whether we are at or near a major uh, pivot point in the market. And there and are how a do lot you know of tools. That? Sorry. And how do you know that? Very, very good question. <laughs> <laughs> so um, tops the million dollar and, question, tops and bottoms right? are a little a little different. Um, uh -huh. You take there's a different tool set required for each one. Now, calling a top is maybe a little more difficult because markets do tend to just slowly keep hitting new highs, new highs, new highs. Everything gets more and more overbought. And market never really reaches that, that extreme threshold at the top end, as it often does at the bottom end, because mm -hmm. fear is just a lot stronger for most of us, an emotional response than, than greed at the top. But if you just put a, a, a trend line underneath the pivot lows in an uptrend and start marking where that trend line gets touched and then marking again where it breaks, mm -hmm. you, you, you know you're at a market top of some kind. And a second thing that you can do is start looking at the volume bars down below. And this is a, something I learned from William O'Neill. And that is that uh, if you mark the big red bars as distribution days, and the big green bars as accumulation days, you can tell whether the trend still has some legs or whether people are starting to get out. Mm -hmm. we, we saw this right at the beginning of, of 2022, right? This right. year, there was a lot of distribution and it was a break of trend. We saw it again in 2007, just before the big 2008 crash. Same, same thing happened. Break of trend, lots of distribution before and after that took place. So that's the top. For, for the bottom, you've got all kinds of interesting tools. So I, I have a whole set that I always consult whenever we're in a prolonged downtrend like we are now. Um, one, one of them is, for example, the, the NASDAQ summation index put together by McClellan. Mm -hmm. And there are certain numbers that when, when that hits below negative 800, we're almost always at a near-term pivot. And when it's below negative 1,000, which it has been this week, we're at a 
we're at or near a major pivot. Uh, we saw that this week. We saw the, the last time we saw that below a negative 1,000 was in December of 2018. December 24th, uh, Christmas Eve was the, <laughs> right. the very yeah, the, bottom. The Christmas Eve massacre. The Christmas, <laughs> the Christmas Eve massacre. <laughs> yeah. And and we were out buying like crazy that day. Um, I mean, I should say not maybe not like crazy because it's always a fearful thing to step back into a major major pullback like that. Right. But it, Everything else was flagging extreme, extreme, extreme. And the, the other time we saw below 1,000 was uh, at the bottom in um, the COVID bottom. Mm -hmm. And again, in 2009, beginning of the end of the, uh, the, mm -hmm. the financial crash. So that's a good tool. Um, mm -hmm. I always keep an eye on the VIX, especially when we're volatile like we are now. Um, when it gets stretched up above the upper Bollinger Band, that's usually a signal that we're due pretty quick snap back sometime soon. Um, market breadth, market market internals, uh, look, keeping an eye on highs and lows, bullish percents. Those are the sorts of markers that can give you ex readings at the extreme. And when you start seeing a, a whole collection of those add up, you know you're at close or near, if not right at a, a market bottom, major market bottom. That's, that's kind of where we're at right now, I have to say. Mm -hmm. so, well, it's so, interesting that you say that because we were just talking with Charles Harris last week on our right. podcast about these secondary indicators. And uh, so, you know, in a way, this kind of like sets up the stage for, OK, you're near bottom. But what tells you that the bottom has put in? Do you just do you just start buying when those indicators get to those oversold levels? Or what is it that gives you your final? OK, now. Now it's not maybe not safe isn't the right yeah. word, but safer. Right. No, that's a great question. And there's a, there's a very good and easy answer to that. Um, let me just first mention that another indicator that is not regularly consulted, but which just gave an extreme reading that I've never seen before. That is the amount of retail participation in the market. It's at a low that people that have been keeping those numbers, and I don't know who that who it is, and I don't know how long they've been keeping the numbers, but it just hit the lowest low ever. Wow. The number for, of people, re retail investors, retail traders, yeah. who are just not in the market anymore. So, I mean, that's a pretty big switch because earlier this year and really the first few months of this year, the re retail was buying these dips, right? Yeah. 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 And, and that's that dropped very, very fast. So there, wow. there's, there's a number of anomalies in this market that kind of make your head scratch a little bit, you know, like... Um, we're still seeing strong job numbers. We're not seeing huge spikes in jobless claims. Um, consumer sentiment is still really high. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, credit ratings are still healthy. Mm -hmm. So there's still, you know, there's some, some disconnects there, but uh, to get back to your question, Justin, there is a very simple pattern. I, I teach this to my clients all the time that uh, when you're at a major market bottom, you want to look for something in price and that is and it's very simple you want to see a higher pivot low and then you want to see a run that takes out the most recent pivot high so it's kind of a like an a, a, i don't know what the shape of that is but a little bit of a cup and handle down there at the bottom a on higher what time low. frame are you are you looking at though is, is there a specific time frame yeah well or... this would be all on the daily chart of course okay. if you're looking at sort of you know okay now that that whole pullback is behind us now let's let's look ahead to the new bull market which we're not there yet but mm -hmm. it's it's coming fairly soon but you can do the same thing on hourly charts you can do it on 15 minute charts on two minute charts looking for that you know long 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 pullback and then you get the higher pivot low that then takes out the most recent pivot high and that 90 percent of the time is going to mark a pretty good significant pivot in the market. Mm -hmm. And when you get one of those pivots, uh, one of those signals, uh, do you have an expectation of how long it lasts, how powerful it will be? Or is that just something you have to see play out? Yeah, I don't. I don't have any kind of statistics on that. It's a good question. But yeah. uh, typically, in, in my kind of halfway educated uh, uh, estimation, the, it takes a lot longer for the market to go up than it does to go down. It tends to go down with the elevator, go up by the stairs. 
Right. And so if the pullback, the bear market market correction is eight months long, then I think we can at least double that for the bull run that succeeds it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about how you're viewing the current market, uh, the price action, what exactly you look at, and how you're playing things in the current market environment. Stay tuned. Sure. We'll be right back. Hey, trader. Will tomorrow be a market rally or a market crash? Well, you can finally stop guessing what's going to happen next. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com and find out how Vantage Point's patented artificial intelligence can forecast stock market trends up to 72 hours in advance with incredible accuracy. Vantage Point's AI technology analyzes huge quantities of global data in seconds. Check out www.freestockcoaching.com and experience Vantage Point for free. Learn how successful traders generate their wealth. Trading involves financial risk and is not suitable for all investors. Past results do not guarantee future performance. Go to www.freestockcoaching.com now. Okay, welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Vantage Point. It's Justin Nielsen here. And as always, I'm joined by Arusha Pires, O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager. And on the show this week, we are also joined by Dr. Thomas Carr. He is also known as Dr. Stock. So, uh, Dr. Tom, we uh, were talking a little bit about how you're viewing the current market, the indicators that you're looking at, and how close we are to this bottom. So maybe we could just pull up a chart and start getting your take on things. Of course, you know, we've been in this bear market for pretty much the entire 2022. Right. Uh, and it's it's been it's been tough out there. So what's your take on where we're at now? Is this um, is this truly the bottom or do we have more more to go? Well, the the problem with just looking at a chart to answer that question, and it's a great question. It's the question we're all asking uh, <laughs> is that the, the market, as we all know, is governed to a far lesser extent by technicals than by the macro picture, the fundamental macro picture, the economic picture, what the Fed is doing, what inflation is doing, what the rates are doing and are not doing, you know, the dollar, all of that. So there, we, we to understand the, the bottom in the market, we really have to uh, keep a very close eye on the dollar, on the 10-year yield, which that's kind of the major marker among the yields, mm -hmm. and, and gold. I think gold is a very key indicator because it is a, um, a barometer on Fed fear. So when there's a lot of Fed fear, gold doesn't do very well, and it hasn't been doing very well. Mm -hmm. It's tried a couple of times to kind of break out of its pullback trend, but hasn't been very successful. So we want to see gold rally. We want to see the dollar come in. We want to see yields come in. Um, we want to see the VIX calm down a little bit. So those are some other things that we'll keep an eye on to confirm that we're at a bottom. But the bigger picture right now is that we need to see a very quiet CPI and a very humbled Fed <laughs> at the November meeting. And that's coming up, right? It's just a couple of weeks from now. I think earnings are, you know, that's kind of the main show right now, but they're, they're sort of a side attraction to what's going on in the Fed. And the big question is, the, is the Fed going to ruin the economy or are they going to, you know, kind of bite the bullet, stand aside and do what the market wants it to do, which is start uh, putting on the brakes. We've never seen a Fed rate, raise rates this fast in this sh short of a time. So it's just we're really on sort of uncharted territory here. Um, in any case, let me go ahead and explain the chart that you have. And I don't think everybody is uh, watching this. They're rather listening to it. So I'll try to be as verbal in my descriptions as I can. Uh, but this is the standard daily chart that I use to analyze the, the trend of whatever stock I'm looking at, whatever index I'm looking at. This happens to be the S&P 500, the spider ETF fund for the S&P. Um, let me explain what I've got on here. So the orange line I have there at the top is the 200 period moving average. And you can see that all the price action in this period of time, and this goes back to around May or June, mm -hmm. uh, is all under the 200 period moving average. And if you look at the numbers of the stocks in the 500 that are all under the 200 period moving average, it's most of them. Mm -hmm. 
that yeah. Yeah. everybody's trading under the 200 period moving average. So it's a, it's a big club. And you can also see the 200 period moving average is down sloping. So we know that the longer term trend is, is down. No surprises there. Uh, then we've got the 50 period moving average, which is the black line there in the middle. And it's looking more like a roller coaster. And that's that's actually not a bad thing because that suggests that in recent price action, we're getting a little more up and down movement rather than just straight down. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's a good thing. We want to see price start to uh, consolidate, at least in a sideways uh, pattern, rather than something that just keeps hitting lower lows all the time. The 50 period moving average is suggesting at least that that's, that's happening now. Um, the other thing I have on there, I have the, these three lines in the middle. Those are set at the 34 exponential moving average, all at the 34, and they're set at high, low, and close. Oh, what, okay. they, what they do is they provide a nice set of, of bands in the middle of the trend, right? Highs and lows go on top of those or underneath those. And they kind of act as a as a home base for price. When price is down below, it tends to pull back up into them. When price is up above, it tends to pull back down in, into them. They can act as a as a range of support and resistance. So, when, so you you said the thirty four moving thirty four exponential moving average. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Said at the high, low, and close. And Wh why thirty four? Was was there well, a it's a Fibonacci ratio, and okay. I've fiddled around with the, the 21 and the 54, I think is the next one in the sequence. Okay. And uh, they just don't give me the same kind of, of response. Uh, 34 is a little less re responsive than the 21. So you get fewer false signals and, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. And when those bands get really pinched up, then we know that the stock is not ranging much from high to low when they spread out. We're no, we know we're getting a lot of movement intraday, right? Mm -hmm. The stock is really beginning to, to gear up for a good move, healthy move up or down. Um, all right. Now, the down below, I've got the RSI with a smoothed green line over it. It's a moving average over that. And uh, we can draw our trend lines on top of that. We're looking for uh, divergence from price. So when we see price hitting a lower low and the RSI hitting a higher low, we know that there is some bullish divergence going on. The same thing can be true when price is hitting a higher high, RSI is a lower high. That's about all I use RSI for. Lots of folks will do. And, and, and just to clarify, I want to make sure that people understand that RSI is, of course, the relative strength index, very different from our relative strength rating, you know, where uh, we're looking at a stock and comparing it against all other stocks, um, or in the case of the relative strength line that we have, that's using, you know, on MarketSmith or on investors.com charts, uh, that's using a comparison of that stock to the S&P 500. So there's that comparison feature, whereas the RSI, the relative strength index, isn't really comparing a stock to other instruments, it's comparing it to itself, right? Correct. right? Yes, yeah. exactly. But, and it's set at the standard uh, default periodicity of 14. So if anyone wants to know that, that's where that's at. And the smoothing average there, I think, is a five or a seven moving average. I've got the volume bars uh, there below the price, and you can see they're color coded. Uh, if we have a close below the open, it's a red bar, a close above the open, it's a green bar. And we're looking here for some patterns in price to volume. So if we see a lot of big Red bars, we'll know, we'll know that the bears are in control. We have a lot, a lot of green bars. We know the bulls are in control and vice versa when they switch back and forth. When you drill down, by the way, into one minute, two minute, three minute charts, you'll start to see some really interesting volume patterns. You'll start to see volume rise incrementally in the same color, five or six, seven bars at a time. And you'll see the price going in a very smooth straight line one direction or the other down and you know what that is that's the Program footprint trading. of the algo trading exactly yeah, interesting. yeah some that's kind of a sell signal yeah. a buy signal has triggered maybe a headline has come out or maybe they're they're flashing on something out there the they have these uh programs that will parse out every little word that right. gets yeah. spewed out right, right? so right right right, right just crazy how it works but you yeah. can see it in the one two three minute time frames you can see 
those cell programs, they last uh, five, 10, 15, 20 minutes. And if you can recognize them early enough, you can kind of ride them piggyback. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so anyway, that's that's volume. And I have to credit again, William O'Neill for keeping me attentive to distribution and accumulation patterns in volume. It, it really is very, very helpful. Uh, so the other thing on the chart, and this is my favorite part of the, my toolkit, that is the linear regression channel, which is, are the uh, color-coded bands that you'll see there on either side of price. And I use the LRC in two versions. I use the tighter version, which is set at a 1.5 standard deviation. They give me the darker colored bands, the blue at the top, the salmon color down below. I'm not sure what that color actually is. <laughs> and then overlaid on top of that, I have a 2.0 standard deviation, which gives me a little wider of a range. And it okay. provides these nice little bands. So you have a very light pink band at the bottom and a mm -hmm. powder blue band at the top. The periodicity of the LRC that I'm using is, again, the default periodicity of 100, 100 days. So it's a 100 day look back which does mean that in volatile markets, you're going to see the linear channel tilting up and, and tilting down, you know, from time to time as the data gets dropped off the back end and gets picked up on the front end. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it, and especially in something like the S&P 500, you're going to see the same trend day after day after day, mm -hmm. the same levels of support and resistance. Pink is support, blue is resistance. And if you do this, chart after chart, stock after stock, sector after sector, you're going to see that invariably, when the stock is down to the pink, it turns around. When stock gets up to the top of the blue channel, it turns around. So especially when you have something like the 200 period moving average, they're also interacting with the right, price as it did right. there back in, uh, in uh, August. So uh, those are the tools that I use. Um, you talk about picking bottoms and tops um we are what i would call right now in a bottoming process mm -hmm. we had a bottoming process as you can see back in june and uh for a good month or so about five weeks or so where it's up down up down up down and the lows are a little higher the highs are a little lower but there's a lot of a lot of volatility from week to week you get three or four days in one direction, three or four days in the other direction. Yeah. This is classic price exploration, tends to happen both at tops and bottoms. And I believe that we are in another pattern like that, another situation where we are finding the bottom. Mm -hmm. Now, is this the bottom? <laughs> well, one hopeful sign that it is the bottom is that the numbers that we're seeing in the things that I mentioned retail participation, the NA, NASI, um, bullish percents that drop, dropped way down low. Uh, we're seeing those numbers a lot lower here than they were back in June, July. Mm -hmm. So that, that suggests that we're at a much more extreme low than the previous one. Um, but at the very least, I think we are preparing for a good, healthy bear market run, a relief rally, call it what you will, where we should move back up into that blue band, back up to the 200 period moving average in short order. Mm -hmm. we, we've got a CPI to get through. We've got the yeah. FOMC to get through. We've got another jobs report to come out at the beginning of November yeah. and a whole bunch of earnings between now and then. So it's true. A lot yeah. can happen. Well, and, you know, to, to that end, I mean, you, you said, OK, this this could be at least a bear market rally. At what mm -hmm. point does it look different for oh no, this has now changed character and we're starting a new bull market as opposed to what we've seen for you know the, the, the March and the, the June, July period where it was really just a bear market rally, kind of came up to its 200 day moving average line, got turned away. Um, you, know, you had this small window to trade in as opposed to something like a 2020 where, oh, this is, this is where you can really get aggressive, put, on, put your foot on the gas and, yeah. and make, some, make some good money. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a good comparison to think back to 2020 because a, it wasn't very long ago and all of us were trading it then and we remember it very, very well. Mm -hmm. And and B, it was such a unique situation. So that's true. Right. What what 
turn. I mean, everybody that was shorting the market on the way down knew it was not going to last because it was about the lockdown. Yeah. And the lockdown couldn't be permanent, just couldn't mm -hmm. be. So the turnaround there was, OK, well, it looks like we are at peak lockdown. We're at peak COVID fear. Um, at that point, too, the, the vaccines were kind of on the horizon. So there was some there was some hope in the air. But we we would got to the place where we just couldn't lock down anymore. <laughs> it could mm -hmm. not get yeah. any worse. <laughs> and yeah. it certainly couldn't be sustained because otherwise everything would fall apart. Right. So the situation we're in now is we're being locked down by the Fed. Yeah. And right. I'm not sure that the Fed is at peak Fed just yet. Right. You know, we people have been talking about 100 basis points in November instead of 75. 7550 is the the consensus, but it could be 7575. Well, especially right. after that last CPI report when right. it exactly. came hotter than expected. It's like, "Oh, wait a minute." <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that was a major disappointment and you can see that very clearly in the market. You know, it was a nice 4-day run up into it and then boom, right back down again. Yeah, but that being said, uh, it hasn't sold off heavily this time, right? With with something that much of a major disappointment you would have thought, well, at least I would have thought that we, we probably would have been really close to, to new lows right now. Yeah. And, you know, we are at we are at the lows of the year or at least just off of them. And yep. we are certainly at historic lows for market sentiment and some internal markers, True. as I've True. been saying. But, uh, yeah, I think still the market really would like to see the Fed either say enough is enough we're going to pause and maybe we'll look at next year adding back some i don't think the fed's going to cut anytime soon but just a pause you know yeah. give us a few months to kind of right. let the dust settle right, <laughs> right, right. Uh, or yeah. you know i think you know alternatively if we start seeing you know a cpi report that comes in and it's like oh you know you're you're having an effect the, the, the effect that you wanted and yeah um you know, that's that's where I think people were getting maybe a little bit too hopeful when there was just a a little, you know, drop. Oh, we've you don't know, hopefully hit peak inflation. Yeah. Um, but then, of course, that core inflation uh, got got a little worse. Um, may, maybe we could switch over to the queues because you had another chart uh, and, yeah. and you could kind of go through the process there. And, and is there any difference here between the queues and the process that you just went through on SPY? Um, or is it pretty much telling you a, a similar story? Very similar story. Um, they're, they're trading lock, stock, and barrel, and that's because uh, the same stocks are at the top of the list for both, and they're both weighted yeah. indexes. So, right. You know, they're both Market being driven by the Amazon, the Tesla, the the you know the Apples Am and Googles AMD and Apples, so the, the yeah. fangs at the top. Yeah. So until that changes and they're no longer weighted, then yeah, they're going to be fairly fairly similar. Um, but again, I just wanted to show that the the pink and the blue, as I say often in my trading room, buy the pink, sell the blue, buy the pink, sell the blue. And especially we uh, sell the blue in a downtrend, buy the pink in an uptrend. We're not yet in an uptrend, mm -hmm. but this is not a real steep downtrend either. So that's another thing that is. And that's been cool. slowly shifting, like the, the slowly shifting. Been... Exactly. Okay. That's interesting. Yep. Yeah. 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 And what, what's your take on uh, the Russell 2000? Because the small cap index the russell 2000 seemed like and actually you know the 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 mid cap too uh, if you look at like the s p 400 um like either mm -hmm. iwm or mdy uh they <coughs> they didn't seem to have as much of a shakeout uh below the june lows um they just seemed a little bit stronger uh, do you have any sense of uh, those diverging a little bit in a good way or <clears throat> are those not strong enough to really turn things well the good news about the russell 2000 i'm sorry i don't have a chart for that but uh it did not set a new lower low so mm -hmm. we are at the same low that we hit back in june i think it was for the for the russell yeah, i think it undercut it by 28 cents uh yeah you know, or right. something like that that that's yeah. the, that's identical in my book at least yeah yeah <laughs> um and the other thing about the russell it, is that it did rally all the way up to hit that september pivot high and it looked actually for a little while there like it was going to break through it did not it's pulled back a little bit but and now we're in kind of this box 
in the Russell 2000. And again, it's a bottoming process. I expect still some volatility up and down until we get past that to the upside. Um, but you're right. It is uh, behaving a bit better. Um, I'm actually looking at not the uh, small cap index as much as a consumer discretionary and um, the real estate index. Okay. So I, like I have a, a lot of friends here in Florida. Everybody's in real estate down here in Florida yeah. and they're having a horrible time. Yeah. Nobody's buying houses. There's backlog. There's all kinds of supply chain problems with the home builders and the mortgage rates are way up there, right? They're up a, a 7%. Yeah. Right? So when so we start you're looking to see like a, at the XLRE, is that what you're you generally pull up for for something like that for the real estate? Uh, for real estate, I, I always look at um, well XHB is the home builder okay, so okay. sector fund, okay. and then yep. IYR is the commercial real estate uh, property fund. Okay. okay, so those are the two good two to look at that okay. give you a pretty good idea of how the real estate market is doing. Yeah. Yeah, okay. they, they look pretty weak. <laughs> yeah, they're not doing very well. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so so why is it that you're looking at, at these, given how weak they are? Are you just looking for uh, a buy on the pink? And again, a lot of this is really mean reversion, you know, trading, right? Exactly. Like, okay, That's right. When That's, it gets so, yeah. uh, so outside of that standard deviation, you know, that, yeah. okay, it's, it's, it's going to snap back at some point. So right. are you just looking for these as, as bottoming? Um, yeah, it's just, it's like, just one tool among many. But again... The, the, the keys that we want to see for establishing a major market bottom that we won't revisit for months and months, maybe years, mm -hmm. we've got to see the Fed at least put in a pause. We've got to see CPI come down. CPI, by the way, came down two months in a row. So it was just not as much as expected. Right. So the numbers are turning in the right direction, just not fast enough to satisfy the Fed. And the problem is the Fed... I don't understand why there are so many Fed speeches these days. There's yeah, a Fed all, guy on yeah. about every two hours. You know? yeah, <laughs> and and they're, they're all saying the same thing, right? They're pain, all saying the same pain, thing. Pain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When did that become a thing? I, <laughs> they're not messing around. Yeah. yeah. But man, yeah. when when the Fed, the Fed fear is the dominant thing in the market and you've got Fed guys talking all the time every day, it's just not a good combination. Um, so we really need to see that come down uh, several notches. Yeah. And I think we'll, we'll see a rise in gold. We'll see a fall in yields. We'll see the dollar cool off a little bit. Um, and we'll see some of the European currencies start to catch a bid. Those are the signs I'm looking for that would really give us, if not a full green blast, you know, mortgage of the house, sell the kids back, you know, back up the truck <laughs> and load up everything you can. I don't think we're going to get that kind of a signal for a while, but. Um, we should be able to get a good six, eight month rally from here if we can start to see those things fall into place. Yeah. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the stocks that are on Dr. Tom's radar. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Stock market have you nervous with massive fluctuations? With the impact of inflation and the upcoming midterm elections, it's virtually impossible to guess what will happen next. But with Vantage Point, you won't have to guess. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com to find out how you can forecast market trend changes with up to 87.4% proven accuracy. That's right, 87.4%. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com and find the consistency and confidence you've been looking for in your trading. No more guessing when to get in or out of a trade. Protect your hard-earned capital with Vantage Point. Trading involves financial risk and is not suitable for all investors. Past results do not guarantee future performance. Go to www.freestockcoaching.com now. Okay, everybody, welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Vantage Point. It's Justin Nielsen here along with Arusha Pires. And our guest this week is Dr. Thomas Carr, a founder of Befriend the Trend Trading and also known as Dr. Stocks. We should mention that his Twitter handle is at Dr. Stocks, and that's spelled D-R-S-T-O-X-X. -X. So uh, that's a place that you can follow him. And it's very similar on the, the stock twits, which is um, underscore Dr. Stocks, uh, same spelling. So uh, Dr. Tom, you know, let's uh, talk a little bit about the stocks that are on your radar. Um, what is it that you, are you using these kind of same 
ideas that you just shared with us, you know, with the with the indicators and the, the bands and the moving average lines on your stocks too? Or, you know, what what is it that you kind of, um, or maybe we should back up a little bit. First of all, how do you do your screening? Uh, let's, let's start there. Sure. So I, I'm a uh, very happy user of MarketSmith, the MarketSmith product. I've been representing it uh, to my subscribers and my opt-in mailing list for several years now. And I've created a number of screens there uh, that have been very helpful in teasing out from the market, especially in a time like this, the best stocks, the, mm -hmm. the best companies that are showing the, the strongest price consolidation or movement or relative strength, whatever. Uh, I should back up a little bit and say that um, I really cut my teeth on the theories of two men that uh, founded or built the fundamental analysis platform that I trade from. Okay. One of those is Len Zacks, who is the founder of Zacks Investment Research. And he's an MIT professor, former professor, MIT mathematician. And he did his doctorate at MIT on uh, the fundamental analysis of, pri of uh, the prices of companies after they report earnings. Mm -hmm. And he discovered that the strongest correlation between forward price movement and fundamental metrics of any kind is that found between price and the earnings estimate revision. Mm. So when a company comes out and says, you know what, we, we earned this amount last quarter, but looking ahead to the next quarter, it's going to be even better than we thought. Yeah. So we have to raise our estimates of revenue or, or earnings by X amount. That's an estimate revision. Sometimes it comes from the company. Sometimes it comes from an analyst, mm -hmm. but it can it it comes and it influences the price to a very strong degree over the near term from from the earnings announcement to the next earnings announcement. So that whole quarter. So I, I have that in the back of my mind. I'm always looking for companies that have just or yeah have in the recent past raised their estimates. And the market smith, there, there's not a way to scan for that, but there's a very quick way to see it. And I'll show you that in just a minute. Um, and the other one is uh, is William O'Neill himself, whose can slim method really is such a time tested standard way of an analyzing companies. And there are some features of that in this in this scan. So I just wanted to highlight okay. a few of the features here. So Market Smith has its own proprietary way of rating EPS. I think it has a lot to do with the growth and acceleration of earnings over time. So I want to have an EPS rating uh, at an 80 or higher, which is a high uh, value. And if a company is not making much money or if they are way down on, compared to competitors on, in terms of growth, they're not going to show up at 80 or above. I'm also looking for a relative strength rating of 80 or higher. So the chart is outperforming 80% of the market. That's a good thing. SMR, to me, this is kind of the whole key to the MarketSmith scanning tool. And I equate it with um, what, what uh, Warren Buffett talks about when he speaks of a moat for a company. Yeah. You know, that that margin of safety around the company that makes the company's product line unique. And SMR stands for sales. So sales growth, historic sales growth, accelerating sales growth means your product is in demand. That's a good thing. That's part of the moat. Um, margins. We want to see margins going up, increasing, strong margins that are increasing. That also suggests pricing power. And that suggests that your product is has got a moat around it, right? Compared to competitors. And the third one is the return on equity, which I take to mean a, a, a strong return on equity is a sign of strong company management. Mm -hmm. they, they know how to spend money and how to save money and, and so on. Again, moat around the company. So I'm looking for an SMR rating of an A, not any lower than that. That's the highest rating. I'm looking for some decent accumulation as opposed to distribution. I want the industry group that it's in to be strong. Um, I want an overall comp rating of an 80 or higher. Um, I'm looking for 
fairly liquid stocks, 500,000 shares per day or more of a price of $15 or above. And then here is where we can insert some at least potential for earnings estimate revisions. The earnings estimate uh, part of the scan for either this year or next year, if we set that at 1% or higher, we're only going to get companies that have a revised upward or have a higher estimate for this next year than they had for the previous year. That's a good thing. It doesn't necessarily mean that they came out at their last earnings and said, yeah, you know what, we're going to have to raise our estimates beyond what they were. But the estimates that they have established for the company are larger than they were last year. And that, mm-hmm. that's a big plus. So I want to see that at least a 1% for this year and next year. And then the last one I have is the timeliness rating, which is the, the software's ability to, to tease out strong uh, chart patterns and bullish movement in the price. Okay, so we run all that. This came out with 21 stocks in a pretty bad market, right? So that that's yeah. a decent subset. And from the 21, I drilled down into uh, three three companies that indeed are raising their earnings estimates. So we're right in line with Lenzax, and they've got some nice looking things going on in the chart. Uh, I've got a large cap, a mid cap, and a small cap, too, if that makes any difference to people. Okay. First, the large cap stock, Interactive Brokers, well known, of course, as a capital market play. Uh, it's the broker that I happen to use myself. Mm-hmm. Been using it since 1996. Their services have only gotten better and better over time. They just came out with a fabulous earnings. They actually missed a little bit on revenue, but everything was so strong, and their forward estimates revised so high that the stock shot way up. Now, I'm not recommending it as a buy just yet, but if it can pull back into the previous pivot highs that I see, you'll see there with a short blue line, just above $70 Mm -hmm. per share. You Mm -hmm. want to see a little bit of a pullback there, take a little bit of the risk out of the trade. But man, if you're in a bear market and the index is down near the lows and this guy's up at 52 week highs, there's something good going on there. Right. And here's here's the thesis trade for interactive brokers, I always like to have at at least some kind of a a reason beyond the fundamentals and beyond the chart for for buying a company. And they reported record earnings for uh, the trading of futures. Mm. They make a commission on that, of course, and as well as the margin uh, loan interest. They just recorded record earnings, like they were up 3% over the last quarter which signals to me that more and more people like myself are shortening their time frame and they're going into these micro e-minis, they're going into the e-minis themselves and they're trading futures contracts because it's you can get in and out, in and out, in and out. You don't have to have a $25,000 account to day trade. The, the tax bracket is lowered, all kinds of good reasons. Yeah. And so I think that trend is in the beginning stages and I think interactive brokers will continue to profit from that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's that's my large cap stock. You can see off to the left, I'm sorry, I forgot to point this out. Yeah. If you're listening to the podcast, uh, you won't be able to see this, but there are two numbers there, both in blue. The fact that they're in blue means that estimate earnings for this year and estimate earnings for next year are both higher than they were for the previous year. And you can see that by percentage. If both of those are blue, that's a big thumbs up. We also had 9% and then 32%. I mean, 32% is nothing to sneeze at. Right, exactly. A pretty high number. Right, right. They were actually up 34% this year, largely on on interest, you know, with the rates being so high. Oh, that's right. Yeah. They're earning a lot more interest on Mm -hmm. on the cash that I have invested. (laughs) I'm I'm helping them in their bottom line, plus all of my day trading, all those commissions. Um, Those two little green triangles, I call that the green eye candy. When I see both of those there in place, those signal that at the last quarterly report, the company raised their earnings estimates. We're going to make more money than we thought in the next quarter. And that's true for this current year and projecting on to the next current year. So the two green triangles, two big thumbs up. So financially, over the near term, uh, Interactive Brokers in very good shape. 
Why don't we take a look at the next one, which would be uh, D-A-R, Darling, Darling Ingredients. This is a mm -hmm. maybe a less exciting play, um, but safer and not a bad thing in a market like this. Uh, not quite up at 52-week highs, but we're getting back up there. So Darling is a, um, a ingredients company, and they make a lot of product that go into supplements, um, various food products. They have a little footprint now in the new thing, which I'm not a big fan of, but uh, the, the eating of, of insects. So they're oh, coming out with what, an insect that's a, product. That's a new thing? It's a, it is actually <laughs> well, I, a new thing. I, I've never even heard of it. Well. It's some sort of green energy connection. You know, if we move away oh, from meat move, and move, move away from meat protein. and go towards uh, insects. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. So they're, they're, you know, crushing those up and making them into a powder. And then they put them in various products as protein filler. Right. Um, they just bought out a very large uh, a Europe, I think European or Brazilian collagen factory, uh, collagen company. Collagen is big, big, big. It's a supplement. A lot of people put it in their coffee like I do. Um, very good for your health, very good for your intestines. And it's, it's just catching on like crazy. A lot of people are putting collagen in everything. So that's a big plus for the company. Um, every analyst studying the company, and there's some really big five-star analysts uh, following the company, have it at a buyer better, um, very good uh, ratings. And they grew APS 119% this last year. So all good stuff. Now, it's just about ready to go as far as I'm concerned. I know that from the um, IBD uh, can slim perspective, you've got your buy zone at the breakout level of 80, which is that blue box up there. Right. And then the pink zone that it's currently in is the stop area where you would put your stop loss after you've bought it above 80. I, I'm, I'm a big buyer on pullbacks. I'm, mm -hmm. I rarely buy a company that is, or stock that is actually breaking out. I like to get in before it does. It takes all the risk out of the trade. So many, especially in a bear market like this, so many head fakes, so many false breakouts, bull traps, bear traps. And I would rather get in at uh, some support like it is right now. So it's actually down at the 50 period moving average. And, um, you know, it's a little bit choppy, but uh, that to me looks like a, a pretty decent setup going forward with the expectation it was going to break 80 and then it will test the the previous highs from earlier in the year. So are those kind of your, your targets there where it should go through 80 if it, if it breaks past 80, it should, the, the ultimate target is the 80, 87? Yeah, first swing trade. That's right. Okay. That, those, mm -hmm. are the, those are the, you know, the obvious ones. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The market rarely likes to do what is actually obvious. <laughs> that's, that's unfortunately, true. as we all know. That's true. I like to say that the market is designed to frustrate the greatest number of people for the longest amount of time. Yep. And it's, it's pretty good true. at it, too. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, but you can, uh, you know, the company is coming out with earnings. I don't see an, a, a, a time frame here, but it should be fairly soon. So it might be worth it to wait until that happens. Yeah, but you like can see over on the left-hand side of the chart, we've got the two blue numbers. We've got the two green eye candy triangles there. Um, all big 38 thumbs up. 38% and 30%. So, yeah. again, not, yeah. not, not small numbers there. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I also noticed that you have underlined the 5571 and the 6493. Did you talk about that already? Um, I did not. I just wanted to show that, um, that there is a trend underneath mm -hmm. the lows that we're seeing higher some lows. higher lows. Yeah, some higher lows forming there. And if you look at it from MarketSmith perspective, you can see a cup and handle. The green line is pointing out a cup and handle. Mm -hmm. And if you include the left shoulder there, you could even call it an inverted head and shoulders. I'm not quite sure that's that's the pattern, but this mm -hmm. cup and handle certainly is mm -hmm. viable. And, and on that uh, pattern if you want to play out to the full target of that then you would subtract i can't see it clearly enough the 5071 at the bottom of the cup mm -hmm. yeah 5571 mm -hmm. yeah the 80 of the resistance the the neckline of the cup and handle mm -hmm. subtract those two numbers you get something something around 30 bucks right. you add that to the 80 breakout so 110 that's true would be your ultimate target mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for the for the patient holder of long-term swing trades <laughs> okay. now what yeah. about the stochastics are, are you, you have the stochastics here on the market smooth chart yeah so i wouldn't you, uh... 
Oh, I do. I do use stochastics in my day trading. I, okay. I'm not a. Uh, I don't reference them as much in swing trading. Okay. Mm. Obviously, per the stochastics, the best time to have bought the stock was when it was down there forming that higher low. Right. Um, we're not catching it there, but what you will often see with stochastics that uh, where price is up against some resistance it's going to coil underneath that resistance. It's going to knock on that door several times. The more times it knocks on the door, more likely it is to open. That's and you'll see with stochastics, it'll just kind of fluctuate okay. as that's happening. Okay. So if we were to wait for it to get all the way back down below 30 or 20 again, it's, it would be a long wait. Right. Mm. Yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, and also I should mention that uh, one of the other things that was interesting to me about this company is that they're, um, I, if I remember correctly, and, and this isn't big business for them quite yet, I don't think, but they're also taking like the, the cooking oil and mm. um, fats and everything like that and turning that into biofuel. If yes. I remember oh, correctly, they, right. yeah, they have um, a whole arm for biofuel. That's right. Yes. right. Okay. Yeah. I, I think they had like, uh, was it Chick-fil-A that they had a, a contract with to, you know, take take their uh, take their leftover oil or something like that? Might, um, might be. I, I haven't yeah. seen that, but that might yeah. be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so this is uh, covering now the long, the, the the large cap, the mid cap, and and now. So this would be the smaller cap. It's about a five billion dollar company, um, and this is a pretty solid momentum play. So if you're looking for something a little more exciting, this is in the oil and gas industry, and this is a um, uh, a company that actually takes oil and natural gas out of the ground and then uh, sells it, distributes it. So it's going to be volatile as much as natural gas and oil are volatile. Oil has been holding up pretty well. Uh, natural gas is in a very long downtrend. I don't understand the dynamics there necessarily. I mean, oil came out with a surprising, um, was it a build or draw this morning? But it, the market did exactly the opposite of what it, what it should have done. Uh, and then later re reversed itself and went right back up and closed near the high. So, um, what I like about this one is that is the consolidation. So we've got this price consolidation into what I'm calling an apex setup as the triangle gets or as the price gets closer and closer to the apex of that triangle. We can expect a uh, very strong move to the upside very soon. The move we can expect to the upside because of the uh, long term trend is up. I mean, this is a stock that was down around $7 a share not too yeah. long ago. And yeah. here it is at 18. Right. So it's really had, it, it's up um, 123% year to date in a very bad market. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yep. Um, but as I've been saying all year, practically, the energy space is just about the only game in town for these kinds of charts, these kinds of momentum charts. Yeah, and they have monster numbers too. I mean, you can just see all these yeah, just yeah, on the earnings digit. and sales, and then the re return on equity just huge. Yeah, and if you look at the comp rating of ninety nine, timeliness A, mm -hmm. EPS rating That's of ninety seven, right. it's yep. got the two green triangles. It's got huge numbers yep. on the estimates. Uh, yeah, it's it's just exploding all over the place. So this nice little quiet period for the for the stock, um, I, I think is a is a good uh, place to get in. So you, so you'll, it's kind of like the, the previous example, you'd rather just buy around here while it's near support where it's quieting down before waiting for kind of the breakout past the, the descending trend line. It, that's typically how I trade, right? Okay, I, I, and, and, you know, sometimes it's a small nibble, sometimes it's a half size and then buy an additional half on the breakout. Okay. But I, I just like to take, I like to keep my risk tight. And what you do with this one is that you buy where the price is now inside the triangle. You put your stop just below the triangle. Right, right. So if it does break to the downside, you're out. Yep. And you've got a nice tight risk yeah, on a yeah. momentum stock like this. Yeah, yeah. makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, uh, got to say, this was a really enlightening conversation with you, starting with uh, the theology and philosophy and moving all yes. into, uh, you know, all the indicators that you use and your take on the market. So we really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, you know, people can follow you at uh, Twitter 
at Dr. Stocks, D-R-S-T-O-X-X, uh, or at StockTwits uh, with the underscore uh, Dr. Stocks, D-R-S-T-O-X-X. Um, that's a D-R but... underscore S-T-O-X. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. okay. Uh, no, that's <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, but yeah, de definitely uh, um, worth a follow, you know, kind of get a, a sense of the, the things that you're seeing in the market on a continuous basis. So uh, thanks again for sharing your knowledge with, with our listeners very much. I appreciate it, guys. It's been all my pleasure. Hope okay. to see you again. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so that'll do it for us this week. On the show next week, we're going to have Ryan Williams on. Uh, he is the founder of Cadre. Now, this is someone that I met actually when I was in New York. Um, we were doing a, uh, a event for Market Watch. He was one of the speakers, and so this is going to be a little bit of a real estate chat. Uh, he's got he's got some interesting things that he's doing for giving real estate investor uh, retail investors uh, information on how they can invest in re real estate. So. That'll be an interesting conversation uh, we have with him. So hope you join us for that. Thanks a lot for staying with us this week, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye now. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you wanna watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.